Help give kids an extra life by donating today to help sick and injured children. Link in the description and pinned comment below. If you want to protect your computer from malware, it's important to have the right equipment for the job. Time to return to the Mega Multiverse, because with the release of the Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection on the horizon, I figured it was time to tackle a long, long overdue topic. Several years ago, I did a collab on the best net navvies in the Mega Man Battle Network series, so now I believe it's only fair to talk about the worst. Whether it's for their design, scenario, or battle, whether they're disappointingly easy or painfully annoying, these are the navvies that make me dread where the age of AI is going. Now remember, I'm basing my picks on the games themselves, and not other media such as the manga or the anime. And since a new generation of gamers is probably being introduced to these games for the first time, I think it's fair to put up a spoiler warning. You're gonna want to run a fresh malware scan after this, because we're about to put out an all-officials bulletin on Cyberworld's least wanted. Legs go, man. It's game time! Battle Network 6 was the big climax of the series, and they wanted to go out with a bang. In some areas, yeah, they succeeded. The cross system felt like a natural extension of Double Soul, and the navvies that were a part of the cross system were pretty cool with some nice side quests. Not to mention that the side beasts felt like a legitimate threat. On the other hand, Land's new classmates were poor substitutes for the old crew, and the World 3 agents were, with only a couple of exceptions, mostly lackluster. I could have gone with any of these clowns, but I decided on the one that was the entire circus. Now, I know the reputation that clowns have nowadays, but Circus Man feels like an Abby that tries to have his cake and eat it too, only to have a pie of mediocrity land square in his dumb face. It's the Navi of Yuika, who was responsible for stealing energy from net navvies to awaken the side beasts to begin with, only to let one get away after being cornered. He later shows up to try to stop your version's Link Navi from getting the cleansing water to Mega Man, only to send viruses after you instead of facing you himself. And when you actually do face him as Mega Man, he turns out to be little more than a slapstick act for your brand spanking new beast outpowers. Weak. And even his stronger versions aren't that special. He just attempts his, admittedly thematically appropriate attacks more times in a row. And even for a clown, this guy just looks... bland. There are a lot more interesting clown characters, even within Mega Man itself. It's like he tries too hard to be serious while still looking in character, but ends up committing the grave sin of being unmemorable. And when you're basing your whole personality on being a clown, forgettability is the worst mistake you can make. Either be Heath Ledger or Mark Hamill. You can't be both. Speaking of navvies that play themselves up as being classic counterparts without actually being classic counterparts, let's talk about the post-game of Battle Network 2. Specifically, the World 3 area in the depths of the Undernet, where the organization retreated to lick their wounds after the first game. You'll need to prove your mettle to even access this hidden area, let alone get very far. Inside lurks a maze filled with gateways that require you to collect every prior chip and face the strongest viruses in the game. And waiting at the end is Astromat. Oh, oh crap, I'm sorry. Planet Man. Jeez, if you're gonna go, go all in, why don't ya? This half-assed design is indicative of a bigger problem with this net navvy. Much like Circus Man before him, he's just forgettable. The fact that he's a post-game boss with so little relevance in the greater scope of things really hurts him. His whole deal was that he set up this whole test hoping to recruit more members for World 3. Okay, first off, did he really think Mega Man was gonna join? We're talking about the Navi that blew the life virus to the recycle bin. Twice! And second, you're talking to a grade school student. As for Planet Man's fight, he's just... <laughs> that they were trying way too hard to make him look like a counterpart of Astro Man without actually calling him Astro Man. Right down to the planetoids that circle around him. Oh, by the way, those planets have elements, and most of the attacks come from them. 
and they can also be destroyed, but he'll just summon more. Not to mention, he also summons tiny spacecraft to shoot at you. Yeah, this fight is annoying. The only attack he does himself is unleashing meteors to smash into your panels, which he does after he reaches half health. Also, if he spawns planets once he's below quarter health, he can spawn a green planet which heals him. And this is especially bothersome when you consider that his V3 battle has the most HP in the game, even more than Base himself. So when you combine a forgettable Navi with an annoying fight, it makes you wonder why this guy was the interim leader of World 3 to begin with. I'm sure Wily didn't miss this failure at all. Also, before we move on, quick shout out to Jewel Maiden Music, who did the remix you're hearing now. Be sure to check out her other remixes on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Music. Great stuff there. Anyways, we're moving on. Let's go. Sticking with Battle Network 2, let's talk about the penultimate chapter of the game, as the Gospel Net Mafia makes its big move. And it's a move of biblical proportions. Earthquakes, floods, heat waves, it's a man-made climate disaster! Or as it turns out, Navi-made. The world's environmental systems have been frozen over and it's caused complete chaos. So after making contact with an informant in the Undernet and obtaining the means to shatter the ice that's been covering the cyber world, we locate the mastermind behind this catastrophe, and it's... Tonight's forecast. A freeze is coming. This is Freeze Man, Gospel's supposed supreme commander. He orchestrated this whole civilization destruction plan for no other reason than to cover for the real leader while he was putting the finishing touches on his fake base. And already you can see the downgrade from the classic counterpart. It's like taking Mr. Freeze from the animated series and replacing him with the version from Batman and Robin, minus the ice puns. I guess then I should be glad that this Navi has no personality to speak of. All we get from him is that he's cold and ruthless. As for the fight, he's a self-sabotaging coward. He starts by encasing himself in ice and won't take damage until you shatter it, after which he'll trigger a permanent wind effect to blow you backwards. His other attacks are also hella basic. Icicles and ice towers, that's it. Come on, get creative here! Not to mention, the most annoying aspect of this fight is also his downfall. It's the Ice Stage. While it does make movement annoying, it also doubles his existing weakness to electric attacks, and you should have plenty by now. Not to mention, he's just... That he's making himself an easy target for your attacks, which, let me remind you, electric attacks are four times as effective due to the Ice Stage and his own Aqua Element. For being a Supreme Commander, you'd think Freeze Man would have more strategy up his sleeves, but no! It looks like both Commander Navis in this game are rather incompetent. And in the end, it turns out that Cool Hand Luke over here was the linchpin keeping all that ice intact on the net, as it all crumbles like glass once he's defeated only solving all our problems was as easy as putting the head honcho on ice. And that makes twice already that I've compared a knit navy with a Batman villain. We should stop doing that. Battle Network 5 was definitely an improvement over the previous game. The whole idea of being able to use other net navvies in battle was one of the best things about it, and the navvies who were a part of the resistance against Nebula were fun to use in both versions of the game. Of course, that came with a caveat. Almost all of the time using said navvies was used in the Liberation missions. Now I actually like these missions. It added some strategy to your virus busting, kind of like Fire Emblem Light. What I didn't like, for the most part, were the Dark Lloyds you had to take down. With the exception of the Reborn Shade Man, Nebula's forces were bland at best and annoying at worst. And arguably the biggest offender was Cloud Man. This is the Dark Lloyd responsible for occupying Scilab and covering the net with clouds to block the way. When you actually confront him, however, he'll fry your nerves. The only really cool thing about him is his design. It looks like a step up from his classic counterpart's derpy design. Everything else, however, just doesn't do the job. For one thing, like most of the Dark Lloyds, he's got little to no personality. He's just doing his job and nothing else. And the battle with him is a pain in the Nimbo Stratus. He protects himself with mini clouds that go down with the shot but regenerate constantly. Not to mention, they fire electrical bolts at you. Alongside that, he'll summon more clouds that shock the adjacent panels, meaning you're gonna have to be moving constantly. And his big attack has him summon a giant thundercloud that chases you while you're trying to track down the cloud that he's hiding in before you get electrocuted. So unless you have a bunch of multi-shot chips or wood element attacks, you're likely to need multiple navvies to take this guy down. 
And all those clouds? Of course they get worse in later versions of the fight. In fact, to be perfectly honest, this is just a worse version of Thunder Man from 2 and 4. Yeah, a real shocker there. And as one last middle finger, his last act of dickery is the game changer of capturing Mega Man so that Regal's goons can corrupt him into Dark Mega Man. So not only is Thunder Man a bland and annoying fight, he's also a total dick. As if it wasn't clear enough that Regal didn't even bother putting the mask back on after it slipped at the end of 4. <sighs> Reaching the halfway point of this list and we're already back to where we started. The first Battle Network game may have been the launching point for this branch of the timeline, but I would be lying if I said that there weren't quite a few rough edges. Mainly in the fact that the battle system hadn't been fully fleshed out yet, subchips and styles weren't a thing yet, oh, and the fact that you needed a battle chip just to run away from battles! But at least World 3 proved itself to be a threatening presence throughout... most of the game. You see, while we got some entertaining characters from the human antagonists in their own navvies, the navvies without operators are... well, they exist. We're all just blocking the street. We're all just blocking the street. Stone Man is as bland as his classic series counterpart, but at least the original Stone Man actually, you know, moves. This navvy counterpart is just around to block the Metro line as part of World 3's plan to cause chaos on the net. Not to mention, his design makes him look like a mini-boss more than a real Navi. Way too big and clunky. And he easily has the least amount of personality of any of the Navis in the main story. His only interesting attribute is his Animal Crossing-esque speech pattern of saying gawk gawk. Other than that, there's nothing about him that really stands out. Not to mention, his boss fight is a total joke. He has only two easily avoidable attacks. The first being slamming his comically oversized fists into the ground and making boulders drop from the skies, which you can easily tell by the shadows on the ground. The only other attack he has is firing a giant laser from his hands, which again is insultingly telegraphed. Oh yeah, he can also summon the occasional rock cube to get in your way. But the worst part is again that he's just... <laughs> that this guy is just the Battle Network equivalent of Snorlax! Unfortunately, unlike Snorlax, you can't just poke flute this problem away. We have to do things the hard way. And the later versions of the fight don't change anything up. Yeah, I know how much chaos blocking the subway can cause, assuming that Electopia doesn't use cars as default, but I just can't take an enemy seriously when the extent of their strategy amounts to... I threw a rock at him! And when you look at the rest of World 3's navvies, Fireman, Elec Man, Color Man, hell, even Bomb Man and Magic Man, and then you see this Minecraft reject, you can definitely tell something isn't quite right here. You realize that a tank is supposed to do more than just soak up damage, right? They actually gotta do something worthwhile! I've said it before and I'll say it again, Battle Network 3 is my favorite in this line. With the addition of the Navi Customizer, the improved styles, the sleek interface and stellar soundtrack, not to mention the story was easy enough to follow while not being insulting. However, the game's quality makes it all the more jarring when something takes you out of the experience and into the fire. Speaking of which, hello again, Mr. Match! Oh, here to help us out this time? Yeah, sure, we can totally trust him. Oh, wait, he tricked us into causing fires on the net! Oh, there's a big surprise! So now we gotta get even. Well, considering that Fireman is iconic and Heatman gave us a good fight in Battle Network 2, we're expecting a good battle here too, right? <laughs> well, sorry to douse your flame, but don't worry. Flame Man will raise your temperature through the roof from being such a goddamn pain. First of all, oh my god, this design ranks up there with Stone Man with being one of the worst downgrades in the series compared to his classic counterpart. Classic series? Middle East-inspired, oil-powered hothead fresh out of Agrabah. Here, though, he just looks like some uninspired fire golem. Certainly doesn't set me ablaze, but his fight certainly gets me heated, from sheer annoyance. On his own, he has one single attack, a basic bitch fire breath attack that would make Bowser blush from embarrassment. He is completely dependent on the two candles in the back row. They are what make this fight so annoying. They have three different color flames, and each one is a different shade of frustration. If they glow yellow, flames will circle around the center square, leaving only the middle as a safe zone until Flameface decides to chug the habanero sauce down your row. If they glow green, then they create a barrier which renders him too hot to touch until they're both put out. And if they glow red, 
Flame Man will heal himself. Yeah, sure, you can put them out, but the flame will regenerate, and if they're different colors, he gets both effects. So you could be dealing with a situation where he's both invincible and regenerating health. Or you could be having to dodge the circling flames while trying to get all the candles out so you can actually damage him. And those flames regenerate even faster at higher levels. So you'd better have plenty of aqua chips for the fight, or I hope you've got plenty of fire insurance. Oh, and by the way, the official Complete Works art book reveals that earlier designs of Flame Man looked a lot closer to his classic design. We could have had something that was much cooler, but instead... Look how they massacred my boy. Hey, wanna know another thing that was proof of the first Battle Network's first game syndrome? Yeah, the post-game. Unlike the other games where there's at least some story going on in the post-game, the first Battle Network just has a few optional battles. They require a certain level to even fight them, they have no story attached to them, and they appear right the hell out of nowhere without any context whatsoever. And wouldn't you know it, one of them bastardizes one of my favorite Robot Masters from the classic series. Because what list of evils would be complete without the influence of the greatest evil depicted in reality or fiction which threatens all we've ever loved? Ancient Egypt! What is this, Capcom? No, seriously, what in the name of Slifer is this? You take the robot master with the stones to punch Mega Man in the face and reduce him to a coffin? Hell, to even be able to fight Feral Man in Battle Network 1, you have to have enough power-ups and HP memories to reach level 70, and then he shows up in a nondescript dead end. How appropriate. And you thought a great boss battle would be inside this coffin, but it was I, Dio! Disappointed. Yeah, this fight is as much of a letdown as his design. His main method of battle is just floating around and dropping coffins that do all the work. It could be a giant ancient Egyptian laser beam of death and destruction, lols. It could be a raton ship attack, or it could just... I threw a rock at him! Once in a while, he can also lay down a trap, and it could release a snake that will track you down like scalpers track down every new console upon release day, a statue that's more toxic than every Twitter fandom put together, or the classic arrow switch. No guts to attack you himself, and no super cool fireball. Oh, but wait! He returns in Battle Network 2's postgame, and he actually has dialogue this time! And his fight is almost identical, except he's always protected by floating coffins, and the arrow trap is replaced by a meteor trap. Lovely. Oh, but wait! He appears again in Network Transmission, and the fight is actually canon! And he just keeps floating around to summon more sarcophagi that release more rats, lasers, and poison. Just... how? How do you make one of the most badass Robot Masters in the Classic series both lazy and annoying? And I know this has no bearing on the list, but why did they make him the big threat in Season 1 of the anime and give the Life Virus a one-off in Season 2 with no build-up whatsoever? That's the exact opposite of how the games handled it! When you make a random Navi more of a threat than the proper weapon of the evil organization themselves, you can tell there's something rotten in the state of Electopia. Mega Man Network Transmission. Well, this was certainly a game that... existed. It wasn't the only side-scrolling spin-off from the Battle Network series, but since the Wonder Swan was never released in America, I had to make do with this. And a recent playthrough of the game on stream reminded me how awkward this game is. It seems Aurika tried too hard to translate the style of the Battle Network series to a side-scroller, as a result, you were essentially forced to use chips in the early going since your buster started off weaker than Twitter's spaghetti code. And the boss battles were a mix of overly strict timing to dodge attacks, ridiculously short windows to attack yourself, or in some cases, both. Arguably the worst of the bunch was Bright Man. Having run amok after getting hijacked by the fake Zero Virus vaccine, he has been causing chaos in the shopping center's network. And now we have to track him down and take care of business. Okay, first off, this guy just looks ridiculous. Instead of having a light bulb on his head, we have a dingus with electrical plugs for hair. But again, it's the fight that shorts my circuits, because it caused me nothing but frustration. His main attacks from range are a laser that can change direction once to home in on your location, and an electrical ball that will slowly home in on you. You'll have to be extremely careful when jumping or sliding to dodge the laser, otherwise it will turn right towards you and hit you mid-action. 
As for the Spark Ball, he'll likely fire another attack while you're trying to dodge. And if you get in close, well, he's got that covered as well. Thanks to his plug hair. The lariat he does with his hair is enough of a problem with being in close, but that's not the worst of it. It's the fact that his other close range attack drains your health. Aren't vampires supposed to be afraid of bright light? Cyber World's got everything backwards, I swear. But what really makes this fight annoying is his Tesla Forsaken Barrier. He'll throw it up when he's attacked and counter with one of his own attacks, leaving you with very little time to counter his counter. In other words, doing damage to the guy will very likely put you in danger, which, giving Network Transmissions gameplay, is a place you never want to be in. Hopefully you've gone to Needleman stage beforehand and stockpiled a crap ton of wood element chips, because in all honesty, you'll want to end this fight fast, because the longer it drags out, the more likely you'll end up with a power outage, whether it be from you dying or the sheer annoyance from having so little opportunity to attack. And considering that you typically have to wait a whole minute to open the custom screen again, you'd better have subchips, a stacked folder, or a good amount of luck if you want to end this in any reasonable amount of time. And in a game where navvies like Swordman and Gravity Man have really annoying fights as well, this one really stands out for its propensity towards ticking me off. Honestly, the rare chip Higsby's offering me better be damn well worth it. Thanks, Higsby! To think we've gone through this whole list so far, and this is the only time that I've brought up the black sheep of the franchise. I am, of course, referring to Battle Network 4. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Forward, neutral, down, down, forward, two. Also, this game is indeed the weakest in the main series. Yeah, it introduced Double Soul, which was a cool idea, but the dark ships were not worth the trade-off for a story element, the plot was disjointed, the initial localization was rife with errors, oh, in order to get everything you had to play through the game THREE TIMES! As for the boss lineup, all but a few of them were in the tournaments, and while several returning navvies had strong performances, including the only battle in the main series with Roll, the same can't be said for most of the newcomers. Apart from Searchman and maybe Windman, they really didn't do all that much to stand out, at least in a positive sense. There is, however, one big burning negative standout. Well, I guess I shouldn't be freaking surprised. Just like Burner Man was a massive fire up my ass, his Battle Network counterpart burns me up just as much! Literally the only thing that stands out about this navvy is that his design is faithful to the original counterpart, with the propane and the propane accessories and all that, but everything else about this flamer is a clean burning hell, I'll tell ya. What? This is the navvy of Atsuki, a competitor in the Eagle slash Hawk tournament to decide Electopia's champion. When the Navi appears on the bracket next to land, however, our hero's thoughts turn to our long-time hot-headed nemesis, Mr. Match. Except Match's ears must have been burning because he immediately comes waltzing in because he wanted to see the upstart who's Burner Man's actual operator. And they immediately get into a fight which ends up setting the net on fire. And when Lan catches up with them and tries to break up the fight, the only thing that gets them to stop is... EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! Hey, Lan does have a good point, you know. Anyways, what really gets me is, again, his battle. He's only got two attacks on his own. A Bob standard flamethrower, and a charging attack with the flame jet on his head. On their own, those attacks are easy to dodge. They are not the issue. What really burns me up are the flame jets on the top and bottom of the stage. They move across the rows continuously, and when they line up with you, they'll ignite and burn the column. So unless you've got a breaking chip to get rid of the damn things, you're constantly dodging both the flame jets and Burner Man's attacks at the same time, and it's infuriating! Not to mention, Atsuki's a sore loser! The only thing that would have made this Navi worse is if the game had voice acting. The very thought of the kind of voice this guy would have gives me flashbacks of bad memories that I will not subject you to. I'm a ranter, not a monster. I have standards, but if you know, you know. And before we move on to number one, here are a few dishonorable mentions. Sparkman from Battle Network 4. Drillman from Battle Network 3. Swordman from Network Transmission. Diveman from Battle Network 6. And Coldman from Battle Network 4. And now, let's hear what the Arcade Nation has to say with this month's patron picks. Starman may just look like a cute little alien of a navvy, this little imp spreads around a virus in the form of a fake vaccine, 
and causes nothing but trouble in a game that's already a massive pain in the ass to play with some stiff controls. It's no wonder he's a dark boy in the anime. Generally, the bad net navvies that I've covered fall into two categories. Ones that are absolutely pathetic and would get laughed out of the Discord servers, and ones who are irritatingly annoying and would absolutely be at home on 4chan. But somehow, some way, there's a Navi in existence that manages to be both at the same time. It's like the essence of the incels you find whining on Twitter about problems they made up was transformed into a Navi. Which means there was an obvious pick for the top spot on this list. And I'm far from alone here. A lot of people hate this Navi. And for frickin' good reason. And it says a lot about Battle Network 3 that even having the worst net Navi of the lot isn't enough to damage its overall quality. So let's get this over with and burst this bubble. Bubble Man. Freaking Bubble Man. This piece of junk data was a lock for number one from the very beginning. Everything that can go wrong with a Navi, Bubble Man has it up the wazoo. It's one of the World 3 Navis that doesn't have an operator, and even the rest of World 3 knows he's pathetic. I mean, look at him. He looks like a bratty kid who's starved for attention. Even compared to his classic series counterpart, he looks like a wimp. Speaking of being starved for attention, his big plan is to use bugged washing machines to create explosive bubbles, hoping that Wily will reward him for it. And when you find him, he turns out to be a massive coward! He leads you on a chase all across the net, only to hide on a narrow bridge, so you have to go to Scilab to get a compression program, except the program needs to be converted to a Navi customizer program by the conveniently present Cossack, then you have to go all the way back across the net again, only for Bubble Man to hide behind a barrier, and giving the means to pop that barrier to his minions who go back to various places around the net to hide from you, so you have to track them down, get the needle, then come all the way back to where Bubble Man is, just to fight him. And what is your big reward for all that running around? The most annoying Navi battle in the whole series. He continues his cowardly ways with a rock to hide behind, and throws crabs at you. But the source of this battle's irritation is the hole in the center of Bubble Man's side of the stage, which constantly spawns bubbles to get in your way. And as soon as you pop one, another will spawn without fail. And some of them include indestructible fish that charge you, or contain mines that will explode when they get close. And once his health gets low, he starts firing harpoons while wrapping himself in a protective bubble wrap that regenerates constantly. And while it's annoying in his first battle, in later versions, it gets infinitely worse, as the bubbles spawn even faster. So you'd better hope you've got an ice stage and a buttload of electric chips, otherwise you'll be tearing your hair out. Oh, and in case you're wondering, the scenario doesn't even have a satisfying end. Basically, Land gets hit with the idiot stick, and Proto Man has to step in and save the day. God freaking damn it. Oh, and on a side note, he's just as pathetic in the anime, being relegated to comedy relief. He does not belong with the Dark Lloyds, let alone Shade Man's right-hand Navi, but he somehow sticks around from access to Beast Plus! Why?! I hate this punk! He's a coward! He's annoying! He's irritating to fight, and he contributes nothing to the plot! I hate him! I hate him! So to make a long story short, Bubble Man sucks, and I hate him for it. And it really sucks that he has to be a part of my favorite game in the series. Oh, and did we really have to know that Drillman is his cousin? At least Drillman had more bearing on the story than Bubble Man. Believe me, I wish I could wash my hands of him. I'm the Quarter Guy, and until next time, the arcade is closed. Next month, prepare to have your space invaded. Hey everyone, QG here. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Feel free to check out my Twitter and my Twitch streams, and consider supporting me through Patreon, and donating to my extra live campaign to support Children's Wisconsin. Thanks for watching.